This episode is brought to you by UiPath. Human achievement can be slow. 200,000 years to go from the wheel to your jalopy? Really? But today, 90% of the Fortune 500 are accelerating human achievement simply. When AI is everywhere, every process can be automated and accelerated. 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 UiPath, the AI everywhere foundation of innovation. Wars that shaped the world uses dynamic, immersive audio to depict scenes of warfare. Listener discretion is advised. All the families were on the dockside, bands playing. As we slipped away from the quayside, our band was playing... Rod Stewart, we are sailing. We slipped out just at last light. This wall of noise hit the side of the ship. The general public sending us off to sea. It was Monday, the 5th of April, 1982, and Britain was going to war. As afternoon turned towards evening, a hastily assembled task force slipped anchor in Portsmouth Harbour. Sailors lined the decks of the two aircraft carriers, HMS Hermes and HMS Invincible. Bands played on board and on the dockside. Rule Britannia was a popular choice as the crowds waved little paper Union Jacks. The entire venture at the whiff of a colonial war. Great Britain's last hurrah. Ahead of the task force lay an 8,000-mile voyage deep into the South Atlantic, to a far distant outpost over which the Union Jack was supposed to fly. From on board HMS Glamorgan, David Tinker wrote home. We're off to the Falkland Islands to bash the Argentines. Very much a 1914 affair with the Royal Navy going off to defend the colonies, or... Should I be thinking of Suez? Of course, the whole thing may blow over in a week, but the thrill of some real confrontation in a colonial war away from the nuclear bombs is quite exciting. This is Wars That Shaped the World. Britain may have been taken for fools, as April 1st, 1982 merged into the second, and Argentine troops poured ashore in Port Stanley. It left Margaret Thatcher and her government chastened, shamefaced even, across government mistakes had been made, 
there was a demand for heads to roll. John Knott, the Defence Secretary, offered to place his on the block, but instead it was the Foreign Secretary, Lord Carrington, who stepped down. It did not take long for Thatcher to muster a response. The task force set sail three days after news of the invasion reached London, followed three days later by troop ships carrying Royal Marines and paratroopers, the men charged with taking the Falklands back, should it come to that. There remained an expectation around the Cabinet it wouldn't come to an actual fight. It would take weeks for the task force to steam south, plenty of time for a diplomatic solution. And even if that came to naught, surely the sight of British warships steaming into view would send the Argentines hurrying home. Wouldn't it? Just getting the task force together in the blink of a military eye was no mean feat, especially for an armed forces reeling from a barrage of cuts and a military focused ever more tightly on one threat, the Soviet Union. By 1982, the Royal Navy was first and foremost a submarine and anti-submarine force. Indeed, the two main Navy men involved in the Falklands campaign, John Sandy Woodward and John Fieldhouse, were both submariners by trade. Fieldhouse, Commander-in-Chief Fleet, appointed the 50-year-old Woodward to lead the task force. Who is he? Is he in the war? Wondered a sceptical John Knott. But Fieldhouse was adamant this son of a Cornish bank clerk was the man for the job. I have seven pieces in the attack, two bishops, two knights, two rooks, and rooks in the attack. A keen chess player, Woodward was clever and self-confident. Two pawns and bishop, and maybe queen. I changed one attacking piece for one defensive piece, but I have... He was, it was said, admired more than liked by those who served under him. He was trying to be human and not succeeding. One officer was to remark after Woodward's eve of battle address. Others suggested he treated the men like idiots in underplaying the Argentine threat. Woodward was given two aircraft carriers. Air power would be crucial in a battle 8,000 miles from home. Neither carrier was ideal. HMS Invincible was small, HMS Hermes old on her last sea legs. Each was loaded to capacity with sea harriers, but it still left Woodward with the minimum necessary air support. Air defence was also critical. He'd three Type 42 destroyers equipped with state-of-the-art sea darts, Coventry, Glasgow and Sheffield. Ships that, for a time, were to become better known to the British public than the cities they were named for. There was a similar scramble to assemble the land forces. Three Commando Brigade was Britain's rapid response force, led by Brigadier Julian Thompson. Many of his staff were in Denmark, preparing for a NATO exercise, and spent day one pestering British airways for seats on any flight out of Copenhagen. As the Marines hurried back to Plymouth, in Hereford, home of the SAS, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Rose placed his men on standby as soon as he saw the news on the BBC. He reached for the telephone and rang Thompson. That same night, Major Ewan Southby Taylor was at a cruising club dinner in London. He was summoned the next morning because the Falklands was South Betalia's patch. He'd commanded the Marine garrison and fallen in love with the islands, enjoying what he saw as the ruggedness of both terrain and inhabitant. He knew its coastline like the back of his weather beaten hand. I'm so sorry, excuse me for one moment. Thank you. An Arabic speaking adventurer, he was straight out of central casting. The staff car rushed him to Marine HQ on a hill outside Plymouth where Thompson waited impatiently. Right, Ewan, I want it all. Every nook and cranny, the way in, the way out, the good bits, the bad bits, everything. Off you go. I'm listening. Hang on there. If you'll excuse me, sir, I'm not telling you a single thing until you tell me one thing. You promised to take me with you. Ha! <laughs> Ewan, don't worry. You're on the boat. You're coming. An air of excitement gripped Marine HQ as planning began planning with the foot pressed firm to the accelerator. This time was one of the best I've ever spent. Everybody was so elated. 
Everyone was working so hard for a common end. We had nothing but help from the army, the navy, the dockyard. I found people crossing the road to salute. Even the children seemed to catch the mood. There was still one significant problem to solve. How to transport the soldiers those 8,000 miles. The planners pored over the listings of merchant navy ships. Many were suitable for a channel crossing, but this was no D-Day dash to France. It was the Ministry of Defence who came up with the answer. Canberra, a 45,000-ton cruise liner, was to be requisitioned. The Navy dispatched a small team in civilian clothes to join the liner coming back from Gibraltar. Amid bemused holidaymakers, they scouted the ship to determine where helipads, hospitals, command centres and so on would be located. Six days after Argentina invaded, the Canberra, holidaymakers ditched, was ready to take the Marines to war. In Plymouth, South Betalia briefed the Marine commanders. The Marines were Britain's winter warriors, but the Falklands would offer a different challenge. There was no cover. It was boggy, it was cold, and the wind chill made everything worse. All food and water would have to be brought in and carried into battle. This was alien terrain. The soldiers who boarded the Canberra were the cream of Britain's armed forces. Paras, Marines, the SAS, the Special Boat Service. The task force sailed on Monday the 5th of April. Crowds packed the seafront and an armada of small ships saw it off. People cheered, people cried. It was, thought some, like the clock had been turned back to a British war of old. The Daily Express printed a photograph of the Falkland Islanders gathered outside Government House in Stanley. Our loyal subjects, we must defend them, demanded the headline. In the House of Commons, even Michael Foote struck a bombastic note. I know a fascist when I see one. Later that day, Julian Thompson and his staff bundled their kit into helicopters and took off into a gloomy, wet Devon day. They landed on HMS Fearless, found their bunks, it was so crowded South Betalia slept in a bathtub, and settled down to work out how they were going to land on the Falkland. Three days later, Canberra sailed from Southampton amid similar scenes. Bands played, more flags waved, and the Royal Marines went off to war. In the meantime, enter stage right, the diplomat. Both sides began an intensive charm offensive. The battle of hearts and minds had to be won at the United Nations. Sir Anthony Parsons, Britain's ambassador to the UN, paced the long corridors of its New York headquarters, knocking on doors, cajoling, convincing. He put forward a resolution demanding immediate Argentine withdrawal. To secure it, Britain needed 10 of the 15 votes on the UN Security Council. There was a clear 5 for and 5 against, so Britain needed the rest. Jordan, Togo, Zaire, Uganda and Guyana. Parsons worked his persuasive powers to the bone, made it to nine, but Jordan refused. Until Margaret Thatcher phoned King Hussein and pleaded Britain's case. Now, everything rested on the Soviet Union. Would it use its veto? The Argentinian delegation were locked in a room with the Soviets. Surely the Soviets would go against the British and veto the resolution. But, come the vote, the Soviets didn't play their trump card. Britain got its 10, and the resolution, 502, was passed. Argentina should withdraw their troops at once, and both sides were to make all efforts for a negotiated solution. It was Britain's greatest diplomatic success of the post-war era. France promised its unwavering support and promised to no longer supply arms to Argentina. Germany backed Britain, and the EEC followed collective suit. Economic sanctions were imposed, and most painfully of all, 
global banks stopped lending to Argentina. This was a grievous blow. Without foreign loans, there was no road to recovery for Argentina's spluttering economy. As with any post-war conflict, America's response would be decisive. US support for the UK was no given. Some in the administration preferred to back South American neighbours. Quietly, the White House offered behind-the-scenes support to Britain. In public, Alexander Haig, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State, led attempts to bring about a negotiated settlement. After all, were Britain and Argentina really prepared to go to war, to spill blood, over fewer than 2,000 people on a tiny cluster of barren islands far from anywhere? Haig flew to London to begin an intense period of diplomacy. It did not get off to a great start. While he was airborne, Britain declared a 200-mile exclusion zone around the Falkland. Haig pushed for a military stand-down by both sides, followed by a temporary administration for the Falklands while a long-term settlement was found. No, said Thatcher, nothing would happen until Argentina responded to UN Resolution 502. They must, insisted Thatcher, get off our land. Haig flew to Buenos Aires to be greeted by huge demonstrations. Thatcher was depicted everywhere as a pirate, black patch over one eye. Haig had to use a helicopter to get in and out of the Casa Rosada, such were the crowds. Galtieri swigged whiskey through his meetings with America's Secretary of State. A top-secret British briefing paper suggested Galtieri was an alcoholic. The junta remained convinced the British were bluffing. The US team were not optimistic. Like two schoolboys itching for a fight, they'll not be satisfied until there's some blood on the floor. On the flight back to London, Haig telephoned Reagan. He was already getting desperate and floated a desperate idea to the president. If the Brits could sink one Argentine ship, would that satisfy their bloodlust? Britain refused to come out from behind Resolution 502 and insisted on the islanders' right to self-determination. On Sunday, the 18th of April, Haig confronted the junta. Negotiate, or the US would back Britain. Simple as. Admiral Anaya, head of the Argentine Navy and the man who came up with the invasion plan, scoffed at Haig. Anaya, like many in and around the junta, had convinced himself the British were lying. It was nothing but a bluff. He smiled and leaned towards Haig. We don't believe you, he told the stunned Haig. You are lying too. General Galtieri blew with the South Atlantic wind, agreed a point with Haig, then stepped outside the Casa Rosada to wave to cheering crowds and changed his mind. His men would stay on the Malvinas. In London, attention turned from talking. All eyes back on the task force as it prepared to depart Ascension Island for the final leg of its journey. Ascension, a lump of lava far from anywhere, and like the Falklands, a British overseas territory, had become the centre point of the largest British supply operation since the Second World War. Planners huddled over their maps and supply charts. Their plans changed, evolved. They had to. Such had been the rush to leave the UK. Exactly what they had and didn't have only became clear once they approached the danger zone. We were a one-shot operation, you see. It couldn't be like Dieppe, where if we tried and it didn't work, we could make sure we did better next time. We had to get it right in one go. The admirals and generals were outwardly confident but inwardly concerned. Britain's kit, the ships and aircraft and armaments they were sending their men to war in were, well, not all they could be. 
We were heading into the Antarctic winter and we didn't feel prepared. We wore our work gear and overalls, then any civvy jumpers we had. Sometimes we folded newspapers between the layers just to keep warm. Air cover was thin. There were sea harriers, fine aircraft, but untested in combat. And the worry was they'd be no match, either in quantity or quality, for the phantoms and mirages of the Argentine Air Force. Of even greater concern was the lack of an airborne early warning system. One ship's captain said he was waiting for the big reveal as they steamed south, because surely they wouldn't be sent to war without an early warning system. But they were. The radar system was a generation out of date. On the Canberra, one officer bought every tin of Nivea he could find in the ship's shop. He thought it might help give his men some protection from the cold. No one knew quite what to expect. On the 21st of April, two Wessex helicopters took off from HMS Antrim. On board, the mountain troop of D Squadron SAS, destination South Georgia. Their mission, to determine Argentine strength and suitable landing areas. They were flying into a snowstorm. The choppers touched down high on the Fortuna Glacier. Conditions were dire. This was what the SAS were supposed to do, deal with extremes. South Georgia, 800 miles beyond the Falklands, was of no tactical importance. Military thinking expected that once the Falklands were dealt with, a small Argentinian force would surrender. But in London, there were political considerations to be made. It was two weeks since the task force sailed in a blaze of red, white and blue glory. The public were impatient, Parliament was impatient, and across the Atlantic doubts were simmering over whether the British threat was anything more than bluff and bluster. Take back South Georgia, came the order from London, and get on with it. I recall opening my window and looking down a vertical shaft into the bluish icy nothingness. I have no idea how deep it was and I was trying to place a helicopter down. It was the most unpleasant and disorienting experience. There was a snow bridge crumbling under us as the SAS leapt out. I was scared shutless but proud as well. The SAS were dropped in atrocious conditions. A whiteout. It took five hours to make 500 metres across the glacier. The snow, whipped up by 100 mile an hour winds, blocked their machine guns. It was a struggle to even get their tents up. One was blown away. Through the night, they took it in turns to dig away snow at the entrance every 45 minutes. By morning, even the SAS, the elite of the elite, had had enough. Helicopters were sent to get them out. The first Wessex was hit by a sudden whiteout and crashed. The second landed and the SAS and crew from the crashed helicopter scrambled aboard. It took off only to be enveloped in another whiteout. The pilot could see nothing. The crash was inevitable. A signal flashed from HMS Antrim back to London. Two helicopters down, casualties unknown. In London, Sir Terence Lewin, chief of the defence staff, was later to describe it as one of his darkest moments. The first action of the conflict and disaster. Lewin crossed the Downing Street to pass on the grim news. Thatcher was dumbstruck, shocked at the potential loss of a handful of her boys, as she'd taken to calling them. This was the reality of war. For an hour, 
They waited for further news. And then, a minor miracle, one delivered in three remarkable parts. Lieutenant Commander Ian Stanley took another Wessex, and in appalling conditions made it down on the glacier. Minor miracle one. Miracle two, there had not been a single casualty from the two crashes. Miracle three, Stanley made it back to the Antrim, landing the Wessex on its helipad as the ship rolled and swayed on angry seas. But South Georgia still needed to be taken. The second attempt was barely more successful. Trying to land by five inflatables, two suffered engine failure and were swept away into the South Atlantic. It wasn't until the following morning that the frozen SAS men of one boat could be rescued. The other was not found until the following day. A day later, and British fortunes took a turn for the better. There were reports an Argentinian submarine was in the area, and early on the morning of the 25th of April, it was sighted. Three helicopters were dispatched to attack with depth charges, torpedoes, missiles and machine guns. We ran into the attack and I aimed. I think it must have landed right on top of the sub. It detonated instantly because of this noise it made. Somehow the Santa Fe, a Guppy-class submarine, was not sunk, but it was crippled and limped back to South Georgia, where it beached and its crew ran for cover. The 140-strong Argentine garrison appeared panicked by the attack. The company of Royal Marines being sent to carry out the attack was still more than 100 miles away, but the officers on the spot saw their chance. They mustered 75 men, every Marine, SAS and SBS on the Antrim, and attacked. With Antrim bombarding the Argentine positions, the British assault was virtually unopposed. Although, en route, they mistakenly attacked a herd of elephants. The real enemy soldiers surrendered at once, and by quarter past five, Sergeant Major Lofty Gallagher pulled a Union Jack from his pack and ran it up the flagpole. A day later, and the Argentine garrison at Leith surrendered. They were taken prisoner along with the scrap metal dealers who'd caused so much trouble. From disaster to triumph, step one of the Falklands mission had been achieved without a single casualty. Just. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of State for Defence has just come over to give me some very good news, and I think you'd like to have it at once. The uh, message we've got is that British troops landed on South Georgia this afternoon. Shortly after 4 p.m. London... Back home, Thatcher stood on the steps of Downing Street and ordered the media pack to... rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, declare gentlemen. War on it was a celebration as much in relief as anything else. Now attention once again turned back to the Falklands as Admiral Woodward juggled his metaphor. South Georgia was the appetiser. Now this is the heavy punch coming up behind. My battle group is properly formed and ready to strike. This is the run-up to the big match, which in my view should be a walkover. They were supposed to be a tough lot on South Georgia, but they were quick to throw in the towel. We will isolate the troops on the Falklands as those on South Georgia were isolated. The task force steamed south, preparing for war. The mood changed, wills written, insurance papers signed, Weapons armed amid practice, practice, practice. Practice for the real thing. House clearance drills were carried out on one deck of the Canberra, the cabin door thrown open, and with a shout of grenade, an orange lobbed in. Roared on by a right-wing tabloid press, no surrender, declared the Express. Stick it up your junta, thundered the sun. Thatcher's government took stock. While one part of the media seemed hell-bent on wishing for war, others were more circumspect, and some, such as The Guardian, opposed. 
public opinion was not as black and white as Red Top voices portrayed. Around garrison towns and naval ports, there remained doubts as to whether it was worth their men dying for this. Still, further conflict was not certain, and there were many who expected the task force's imminent arrival off the Falklands to spark an Argentine climb down. On the 22nd of April, as the SAS were landing in South Georgia, Francis Pym, Carrington's replacement as Foreign Secretary, took a Concorde flight to New York to meet Haig. Five days later, Haig delivered his final offer to London and Buenos Aires. Eventually, an answer came from Buenos Aires. The bunch of thugs, as Haig was overheard calling the junta, said no. A signal flashed from Task Force HQ into the South Atlantic, where Woodward's fleet had reached the edge of the exclusion zone. As April turned to May, Flight Lieutenant Martin Withers of 101 Squadron, Strike Command, eased his Vulcan bomber off the runway on Ascension Island and set a course for Stanley. Shortly after 4am, he climbed to 10,000 feet and began his bombing run. Only one of his 1,000-pound bombs landed on the target, the runway at Port Stanley Airfield. Nevertheless, a message had been sent. The British were coming. That night, the fleet steamed within flight distance of the Falklands, and once Withers was done, the Sea Harriers took off. They came in low and split up to find their targets, including the Argentine forces at Goose Green and another go at the airfield. The defences had been woken up by the Vulcan. As we came in, it looked like we were watching a child sparkler on Guy Fawkes night. Now it was the Navy's turn. Three ships, Glamorgan, Arrow and Alacrity, sailed to within 12 miles of Port Stanley and opened fire on Argentine positions. At 1.25pm came the Argentine response. Four mirages swept in low from the west. Aircraft, 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 closing fast. We lay flat on the deck, tin helmets on, fingers and ears. First came the screams of, aircraft, aircraft, over the armament broadcast. Bangs as we fired chaff. Whooshes as all 16 chaff rockets were fired. Then, dagger, dagger from the aircraft. Bang, bang, the bombs went off by the stern, lifting the screws right out of the water. We thought we'd been hit, and then whoosh, whoosh, as the rockets went past. As the Mirages turned for home, the Harriers swooped. Two of the four were shot down. The listening ship's radios filled with the shouts of the Argentine pilots, then abrupt silence as the Harriers' missiles hit home. What followed next remains the most contested and most deadly moment of the entire conflict. The cruiser, General Belgrano, was the grand old dame of the Argentine Navy. Despite her age, this was a warship capable of threatening the British fleet, a key ship in Argentina's naval armory. On the afternoon of the 1st of May, Chris Refford Brown, commander of the submarine Conqueror, sighted the Belgrano and two escorts, Exocet armed destroyers. The following morning, a Sunday, Terence Lewin, chief of the defence staff, was driven to Chequers, the Prime Minister's weekend resident. He put the Navy's case to the war cabinet. We want to sink the Belgrano. It's a direct threat to the fleet. It could cost British lives. It could imperil our mission. Thatcher led the discussion. By lunchtime, a decision was reached. It was unanimous. Sink the Belgrano. At nine minutes past six, according to the captain's log, Refford Brown called his men to action station. The Belgrano was 35 miles outside the exclusion zone. Refford Brown decided to launch three torpedoes and spent the next half hour manoeuvring into position. At 1854, he took a last look around. All good. He'd a clear shot. 
two minutes and 45 seconds later, he gave the order. Tubes six, one, and two opened, and three Mark VIII torpedoes arrowed through the water. Refford Brown watched via his periscope. Orange fireballs seen just off the center of target, in line with aftermaths. Second explosion heard about five seconds after. I think I saw a spurt of water after, but it may have been smoke from the first. Third explosion heard, but not seen. Job done. Refford Brown ordered Conqueror to dive. It was time to take evasive action in case the Belgrano's destroyer escorts came hunting. Back on the surface, the Belgrano was in its death throes. The torpedoes had struck the bow and stern, trapping and killing 200 men. As the old cruiser listed to port, the surviving crew scrambled to get on deck and launch the lifeboat. Numbers were burnt badly, others clung to photos of wives, girlfriends, children. Those that survived were to face 30 hours in lifeboats in freezing conditions. The escorts had disappeared. 368 men died. José Luis Ferreira was 17, a conscripted sailor. I lived every second. I wanted to get out alive. I didn't want to die. The lifeboats were made of rubber. We jumped into them. The ship was listing, making whirlpools, and the wind was pushing us against it. The anchor fell into a lifeboat. It was like squashing a snail. Nobody got out of there alive. Then our lifeboat burst and we had to throw ourselves into the sea. I tried to kick off my boots and swim towards another lifeboat. I came across a friend who couldn't swim. He was shouting, help, help. He was covered in oil. He kept going under. I managed to get him on to a lifeboat. I saw the Belgrano disappear into the water. I saw it kill over and that was it. The silence was deafening. There we were, in the middle of nowhere, just water and sky. Ferreira and his comrades were rescued the following day by which time Conqueror had long since flashed a signal back to Northwood, from where it was conveyed to Downing Street. The Belgrano was sunk. Gotcha, as the Sun's infamous headline put it. On HMS Sheffield, the crew on watch cheered when the news came in. But not for long. Mike Norman walked in as the lads were cheering. They're sailors like us, he said. There's 500 men trying to swim around in the water and stay alive. They could be dead. They could be freezing. And tomorrow, it could be us. On HMS Yarmouth, the news was greeted even more solemnly. No one clapped or cheered. We just looked at each other. That was when reality struck that approximately 360 fellow mariners had just died. The Argentine spokesman hit on a neat line. Britain may not rule the waves, but she certainly waves the rules. The attack on the Belgrano shocked the international community. An act of aggression committed outside the exclusion zone on a ship sailing away from the British fleet. Britain's allies swallowed hard. Many in Britain were appalled at the number of lives lost. Those that took the decision stood by it. The Belgrano had to be sunk. She was a real and significant threat to the task force, to the lives of Britain's sailors. This was war, and the experience on the front line was far removed from the tabloid saber rattling back home. The following day, Alan Rich, a helicopter pilot, attacked and sank an Argentine patrol vessel. 
when he stepped back onto the deck of his ship, he was shaking. A day later, and 32-year-old Nick Taylor became the first British combat fatality of the war, when his Harrier was shot down by anti-aircraft fire while attacking Goose Green. It was soon to get a lot worse for the British. It was a clear morning, visibility good. HMS Sheffield was stationed on the task force's southwestern corner. In the operations room, Sheffield's radar picked up something to the west. But what? A returning Harrier? Or a bandit? Up on the bridge, the watch officer spotted smoke on the horizon. Smoke over there. Look, over there. It's a missile. It's a missile! One exocet hit the Sheffield just above the waterline. A split jagged across the hull. Thick black smoke filled the ship's lower decks. The explosion smashed the ship's water supply, so there was nothing to fight the fire with. Men, faces blackened, clustered on the upper decks. They could feel the heat from below. As the heat began coming up the decks, we started throwing all the ammunition out. Bullets, rockets, torpedoes, depth charges, all over the side. Captain Sam Salt was directing everything. Sam was an experienced captain with loads of respect. He was like a father figure, but we could see the shock on his face. For hours, they tried to fight the fire with seawater and hand pumps, but this was a battle they would not win. Four hours after the missile hit, Sam Salt gave the order. Salt, face and body blackened like most of his men, was winched by a Sea King helicopter to a neighbouring ship. Twenty-one of his men were dead. The loss of the Sheffield alarmed everyone in the fleet from top to bottom. Woodward worried about losing an aircraft carrier. To do so would be crippling. The fleet pulled further out to sea. Woodward was to keep his distance from then on. More dire news followed. Two Harriers disappeared, believed to have collided and plunged into the Atlantic. These were losses the British could ill afford. The fleet's own air defence missiles were proving erratic, computer systems struggling to cope with more than one target. HMS Glasgow was hit by a bomb, holding the destroyer just above the waterline, but it failed to explode. That saved ship and crew. Nevertheless, it was the end of Glasgow's involvement. Woodward had lost another ship. Tension gripped the fleet. Submarine attacks were expected. Instead, whales caused false alarms. The days passed. A week, two weeks, and little changed. The task force was not achieving its first task winning the air battle to clear the way for a landing. The Argentine Navy remained in port. The Argentine Air Force committed few planes. They were waiting for the landing. The plan was for the aerial threat to be contained before the Marines and Paris were sent in. That was not going to happen. But the landing still had to. Had to, providing there was not a last-minute diplomatic solution. Behind the scenes, Haig was still trying, feeding a plan to Peru. The seven-point Peru plan was proposed by its president, Belonda Terry. In the wake of the Belgrano sinking, Thatcher was keen to be seen considering peaceful moves. But the junta turned their noses up at Belonda's proposals. The clock was ticking again. The details of Operation Sutton, the landing on the Falklands, were presented to the War Cabinet in London and a date set, the weekend of the 21st and 22nd of May. The UN made one last bid to bring both sides to the table. 
a Spanish UN official cornered an Argentine envoy. You do realize that the British are going to keep the hell out of you. Thatcher addressed Parliament to coincide with a white paper, branded a red, white and blue paper, making the government's case for what was going to happen next. Labour leader Michael Foote, no warmonger, could find no fault. There would be no peaceful solution. Next, on wars that shaped the world. The way they treated us, the officers, they would leave us in the dugouts. It was very cold. We weren't used to the cold and hungry. And, and they would go back to our house and eat and stay warm. And if we did anything wrong, the smallest thing, they would punish us, make us stand in the cold. I think we all wanted to go home. Wars That Shaped the World was a Goal Hanger Podcasts production. It was produced by Holy Smokes. This series was written by Robin Scott Elliott. It was narrated by Paul Waggett. The producer was Neil Fern. The executive producer was Tony Pastor. Holy Smokes.